Sure. Hi, Scott. Good evening. Hi, Diane. Oh, I was trying to figure out who was sped. I forgot it's you, Diane. Good. Okay, let's call the meeting to order. It's exactly six o'clock. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you, everybody. It's like, it's really sunny today. It's just perfect. I'm very excited <laughs> about this meeting. Uh, let's, our, let's try to stay on time today. So let's move right ahead into the executive session and then we'll do our welcome. So I'm wondering if I could have a motion. I move to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. Okay, Jonas moves a second. Second. Chris, second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. I don't see the ayes appear to have it. So let's move into executive session with Brian. And, and somebody I would like else, to have Lori, Yeah, I would like to have Lori there and Carla there this time around. Okay, so with Brian, Lori, and Carla, please, Jim, and now you can do your magic. Sure, I'm working on it right now. We should be up in just a, just a minute here. Thank you all very much for uh, your patience. I just want to do a confirmation of a few people on the board that I, I, um, I just want to make sure Jonathan Goddard is in that meeting, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, we have Lindy in the meeting. Okay. I'm, I think I'm just about set here. If there's it's anybody busy. I missed, then I'll, I'll, I'll do a roll call on that as soon as we're done. I'm going to go ahead and open the room now for okay. executive session. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the main session. Sorry, we took three extra minutes. Hey, I want to welcome all the public that has joined us today. It's exciting to see so many faces, teachers and community members. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> it's so exciting. Um, first, I, I want to start by we have a lot to celebrate today. Uh, uh, Steve Dellinger Page has got the award of Principal of the Year. And uh, uh, another, isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> And we had that great article there, Stephen. Say hello to Stephen. Thank you. We're so lucky. So between all of us here in this meeting today, we have uh, the principal of the year, Alicia, too, the elementary principal, Stephen, and Kate Rob, teacher of the year. So we are really, we, we should be very proud of our staff and administrators and our communities. So just want to celebrate that. And we had that great article in MindShift about our, the great job that our counselors are doing at school and the work that Lisa has been leading and all the counselors at U32. So it's always good to start with a little celebration. Hopefully I didn't steal Brian's thunder on that one, but that's what I had. <laughs> Any agenda revisions for tonight? Scott? Thanks, Laura. Could I uh, request a new agenda item 5.5, .5, reinforcements for the finance committee. Sure. So, okay. I'm gonna, if you're okay, I'm gonna put it with five point, uh, you put it with 5.1, is that what you said? I, I was right thinking at the, the, at the very end, 5.5, .5, but, but entirely as you wish. Okay, I'm gonna put it at the beginning, sort of to order, and I wanted to add a 5.5 a 50th anniversary subcommittee, if that's okay with everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, welcome to our students. Can Could we have our student report? Hi, Hi. how is everybody tonight? Or thank you. Towns is here. Towns, are you here tonight? I am here. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so to start things off, um, seniors <clears throat> um, who have uh, applied to colleges are really starting to hear back from their regular decision applications. I know recently uh, uh, schools like UVM released their admissions decisions. Um, so people are being able to start planning what they're going to do next year. Um, as some of you might know, stage 32 is still going on and there is a video of Antigone up on YouTube now. So if any of you want that, I do have a link and I can send that to you. Yes, um, 
it's really cool. It's all on Zoom. It's cool. Um, the our boys basketball uh, high school basketball team won, uh, won their first game in the playoffs against Middlebury, which is awesome. And their next game is against uh, North Country on Monday. Um, yeah, that's very very good for us. Uh, we also had a woman named Alex um, Chevron Vani reach out to U32, and she interviewed um, the high school counselors as well as myself and wrote an article about how our um, high school counselor system works and how we're the only school uh, where the students get to pick the teachers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, nearing deadline for students is on um, March 18th tomorrow is the uh, application deadline for the Governor's Institute of Vermont, um, a summer program with that um, students can take advantage of to learn a, about a lot of different subjects that are really cool. Students are also um, able to take like full advantage of branching out, CBL, um, and in our newsletters there's some really cool pictures of a student who is making a guitar from scratch and um, Isabel G. Musso, who's a senior, is also doing working with the person who found Pilot, um, which is a full um, branching out program. It takes up a lot of your classes to do some media art, which is very cool. Yes. Um, and this week, there are uh, two career labs where students can um, learn about uh, two different careers. One on the 18th is software development and web design. And then there's another career, career, career lab on the 22nd for um, the Vermont music and radio industry, which is a very exciting opportunity. Yeah, thank you. That's our report. Any questions? Any questions from board members? Sounds like they're all set. Thank you, Anna and Towns. It, Brian, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Floor. And uh, yes, you did steal some of my thunder, but I still want to uh, thank uh, Stephen Dellinger Pate uh, on his uh, major milestone accomplishment. Uh, it, it's not just his accomplishment; it's our district's accomplishment and our and 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 U thirty two's accomplishment. And Stephen has uh, also informed me that informed me of that when I did congratulate him personally earlier in the week. Just very happy uh, that he'll be representing Vermont uh, for the uh, na uh, as it moves on to the national uh, secondary principal of the year. And, uh, and I can't I can't uh, think of a, a better uh, secondary principal to be uh, distinguished with this award. So congratulations, Stephen. The uh, getting into the we have an action packed agenda tonight. So I will uh, make uh, some of my reports uh, shortened tonight. The uh, COVID nineteen update. Just a couple things. Real quick, vaccinations are underway. Uh, I, I I got my vaccination. I'm very happy. I know our teachers are, are and staff are getting them uh, as possibly as we speak. Uh, we are also starting to enter the recovery phase of the uh, pandemic, which uh, will be uh, we will be starting starting to put together a recovery plan, uh, which again will be a very collaborative process. Some hope, hoping to emulate and repeat what we were able to do during the reopening plan uh, now as we move towards recovery. Uh, how do we address learning loss? How do we measure learn, learning loss that happened uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still happening and still going on right now? Uh, and also, uh, how much funding are we gonna be able to uh, get with the uh, next round of ESSER funds? I've heard, uh, I've heard uh, that districts are maybe hearing official numbers shortly but uh so we're waiting to hear what what that is and what we'll be able to do so uh there'll be a lot of work that our leadership team will be focusing on uh with the recovery plan we definitely want to get our, our input from uh stakeholders various stakeholders as well and uh, this will be uh another uh major milestone for our district as we move forward uh i would also uh, just turn it off uh see if is elizabeth here tonight she is Yep, there she, there she is. is. So um, I think the vaccine rollout has been a wonderful, a really good timing. This time of the year, people always get a little depleted, you know, and this year particularly, it's been stressful. So a lot of our staff are going to be able to um, travel or see family over the April, 
<clears throat> April break, which will make it a break, you know, um, which they haven't had in a long time. So I'm really happy that it was a little, a uh, little touch and go to begin with for the rollout, but it seems to be picking up and people are getting appointments and um, that's a good thing. And we also still to date have had no transmission in the schools, which is a really remarkable feat. And we're really happy about that. You know, we've had cases, but nothing, nothing that's anybody who's quarantined has never tested positive. So that's a really wonderful credit to what everybody is doing in the, in the schools and in the classes and the kids are doing, because it's not easy for them. Um, so that's, I think that's a music. I wanted to mention that music is, is, opening up a bit we're gonna have chorus and being able to sing finally again it's been a long time so that's a that's a good um positive thing that's happening too and then sports of course but that's it's rolled out and people are playing and so kids are opening up their lives are opening up a bit you know and we're keeping cautious watch but um so far it's it's gone pretty well so that's about it and this is any questions Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. I uh, will uh, just continue now with just one other thing uh, with the superintendent uh, update here is just to let uh, the school board know that uh, we also uh, are, it is one of the busier times of the year. And of course it's complicated with the pandemic, but we are in the time where we're looking at, you know, our jobs, openings, vacancies, uh, potential transfers between schools. Uh, there are, so it's a, it's a very busy time of year and uh, I think we may need to have a uh, meeting, a special meeting, either March 29th or March 30th in order to comply with any contractual obligations that we may have. So I just wanted to let the school board know that we may need to have a quorum uh, at, least, at the very least for either March 29th or March 30th. And so uh, if there's an issue with either one of those dates, you know, please let me know uh, as we uh, get closer. And I'll have uh, Melissa re uh, reach out to everyone to try to do a poll, see when we can get the most folks. Hey, Brian, do you know do you know that that is going to be a certainty? Uh, I believe it, it, it. I think it could be a certainty. I have another meeting uh, with my leadership team tomorrow, and we're going over over some making sure we dot our I's and cross our T's. But I'm pretty sure we'll have some sort of meeting uh, at, on the 29th or 30th. Okay, thanks. How long would you expect that to be? Uh, it would probably Roughly. be. Uh, very, I think it would be a very short meeting, uh, Jonas. Uh, it would be really more of just getting down to business. Okay. okay. So uh, moving on, uh, this is a big, uh, this has been a, uh, when I was uh, first interviewed as the super, first superintendent, I know that uh, many of the board members uh, learned about my passion for equity and equity in the schools. And uh, I, when I first started, uh, I was even approached by some teachers from U32 to talk to me about the Equity Manifesto and uh, the Equity Scholar and Residence Program uh, that's existed at U32. Uh, there is a lot of work that school districts across Vermont and around the country are working on uh, trying to in ensure that we have equity in our schools. Uh, there is still always work to be done. Uh, and, this, and I think tonight is a real great opportunity to look at uh, what we have been working on here at the district, in the district, and what the possible, what the possibilities are, as well as what the needs are uh, tonight. So I uh, just want to let you know we have an action-packed agenda with equity as equity takes center stage tonight. And if we uh, move through the packet, one thing that you'll see, um, and I'll before I turn this over to Jen Miller Arsenault, uh, is. The, we do have a uh, equity, we are required, every uh, district in the state of Vermont is required to provide the public with a equity supports letter. Uh, when we uh, first learned about the equity supports, a lot. truth be told, a lot of districts in Vermont are learning what does that mean. So uh, if you'll see that there is a letter in the packet that went out, it is a requirement for uh, from the state, the state of Vermont. I, it's also linked to a federal requirement as well to make sure that uh, folks understand that schools in uh, districts require equity supports. Well, and we are, and I'll let Jen Miller talk more about that in her uh, short presentation. So without further ado, uh, we'll turn it over to Jen. 
All right, so hi everybody. I am gonna share my screen with you quickly and just walk you through some of these slides. Get them presentation. Okay, so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to talk with you um, from the Vermont Agency of Education perspective um, about the state plan, the definitions. We'll talk about equity level one, which is what we have been identified for, the requirements, and then a little bit of the support and resources. Most of these slides I lifted directly from the Vermont Agency of Education. So th these are the definitions um, that are most important for us to focus on. I'm not gonna read them for you. I want you to take a minute uh, if you haven't yet done so and see how the Vermont Agency of Education for the purposes of accountability is defining historically marginalized students and historically privileged students. In a minute, I'll show you the chart that shows um, what we have been identified for in each of our schools and the um, importance to focus on the um, equity gap. Um, so that's the gap between um, a particular student group and the inverse of that group. So when we were identified for equity supports one, it means that um, we have a significant difference in student performance. That should not come as a surprise to you. As we've been reviewing our data, we know that we have historically had differences in achievement on these tests, particularly the, the SBAC, um, in performance between various groups of students. In our cases, we often disaggregate and see a significant gap between the performance of students who qualify for free and redu reduced lunch and students who don't, and students who qualify for IEPs and students who don't. Um, and uh, when we have a gap and we're not making changes to narrow that gap, then we were identified for equity one. And as Brian said earlier, many, many, many schools in the state, uh, at more than half, and, and actually I wish I had that number for you off the top of my head, I don't, but the vast majority of um, schools and districts in the state were identified. So what we have um, been told right now is that we have this gap. Um, again, the accountability measure is a, it's a, an, a combination of lots of measures and weighted percentages. Um, it entails the Smarter Balanced Assessment, which uh, assesses literacy and math. The Vermont Science Assessment has a small percentage. The Fitness Gram PE Assessment has a small percentage. Um, and at high school, it is the graduation rate. And then there are two post-secondary measures. Um, that are also factored in each for a small percent. Um, and so we have been identified and we're gonna need to address um, the reasons for identification. So uh, our identification in our schools was based on the data from two years ago. So uh, for Berlin and Callis, they were identified for equity supports one because of the difference in performance for students who qualify for free and reduced lunch and students who don't. In East Montpelier, Romney and U32, um, they combine those groups together. So for all of the groups, which is free and reduced lunch, um, the way that uh, they uh, disaggregate for race and ethnicity, um, IEPs and uh, English language learners all together compose the historically marginalized group. And there is a difference in performance between that group of students and the group of students that is identified as historically privileged. It's important to note that DOTI was not identified in part because you have to have an N size of 25 or higher and DOTI does not have those numbers. 
So we need to make sure that we are uh, creating a goal to address the um, reasons why we were identified in our continuous improvement plans. We need to be reviewing the data and we need to make sure that we are communicating um, with our school communities. So Brian had that letter in the board packet. Each of the principals has sent home a letter in their most recent newsletters. We'll make sure that's posted on the um, websites as well. Uh, you have the letter in your packet for the um, public who didn't receive the letter. Here's a sample, essentially just talking about um, the fact that we have been identified and it means that we will be addressing this um, with more scrutiny and uh, in our continuous improvement plans and that the agency of education is available for some technical assistance. So again, um, right now, as in equity one, we just um, we've, we're doing what we need to do at this point in time. We have been disaggregating our data. When we take up continuous improvement plans, we need to make sure that we have the goals. I'm going to segue to that in just a little bit, because this year with COVID, there's a, a low twist to that. Um, and then Ideally, we're going to get ourselves right out of equity uh, one supports. We're going to ensure that um, our students are performing strongly across the board and that there is uh, little to no difference in performance between those groups. If not, um, then we get uh, identified for equity two and there's progressive support um, and assistance from the state. So I want to talk a bit about the recovery plan. You're going to notice I took, um, I took this moment to put recovery in quotes. I really don't like the terminology uh, of recovery. I think that um, that's deficit thinking. I think that we need to be thinking forward. We need to be redesigning or re-envisioning for all students. Clearly, our current system has not worked for everybody, and it's time to take this up and make the system better for everybody. In the recovery plan, which um, we are going to be getting our heads around and working on the state recovery plan, we um, need to address, we need to do a data analysis and um, look at our student data. So for this year, for all of our schools, the recovery plan um, is meets the requirements of the continuous improvement plan, at least for this spring. The exception is DOTI, because as many of you know, DOTI was identified for comprehensive supports last year. DOTI will engage in continuous improvement planning. Um, so there are just some nuances there. But we are looking at our data. You know, through the Ed Quality Committee, and later tonight, we'll look at the literacy data. We're looking at it um, regularly. So we'll continue to analyze our data. We're awaiting the results of the curriculum management review. Those results can inform our work. You all know, as a, as a board, we're, we're about to embark on a strategic planning process. My, Hope is that we're really looking at issues of equity, that we have a definition, a shared vision, um, and we're going to address it and, and make our schools actual, actualize this vision that we have to make the um, schools a better place for all of our students. We're engaging in professional learning, and I know you're about to hear a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we'll continue to engage in professional learning. We need to maintain a commitment and stay the course. And um, I'll be eager to hear from others about any other next steps. So that's that segment of the presentation. I'm curious if there are questions about the AOE piece. Scott, go ahead. Thanks, Flora. Um, Jen, is there anything in between historically marginalized and historically privileged? Um, no, the, the AOE definition. The groups so, are just the inverse of each other. No, yeah. so no, there's no. It's it's set up in that sort of binary and inverse grouping. So there's just nothing like regular people. No, because if you're if you're not a member of one group, you're a member of the inverse group. Is how the state sure. is def is defining that. Interesting. Thank you. Sure. Caroline. Um, this might be coming later, but um, 
So I'm one, I'm really impressed and surprised that this was able to be um, given out and discussed tonight because it felt to me really like the AOE just um, came out with it. And one thing that I've been wondering about is how much discretion um, each district gets to have in what they do. So uh, what am I asking? I guess I'm wondering, are we taking time to evaluate the specific needs that we have given the definitions that the AOE has supplied um, it, like, are we doing something that we wouldn't have been doing before because of COVID and perhaps the um, historically marginalized students have been marginalized even more or need even more? Or is that really not what this is about? I, like, when I first heard about it, I really thought it was uh, recovery because of what the, the disparities, um, let's just say from last spring and students doing um, the learning at home and, and, you know, so widening that gap, more trauma being into families. Like I thought it was, it was about that. And I guess I, um, I wanna be really clear that if there is time for us to slow down and assess and decide at like and evaluate where are we, I really want us to take that time. And so I guess my question is, um, is it helping us do something different or did, is, are we, were we doing the right planning anyway? Is that clear? Uh, I guess I'm asking Jen, I think, or Brian. So one, I want to make sure my question is really clear because I didn't plan it out ahead of time. Um, and then, yeah, like, is this giving us like this inspiration to, I don't know, investigate and fix and does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will answer that. I guess there are two things and we're sort of conflating the identification for equity supports and the recovery plan, right? There, there is a, a timeline for that re recovery plan that is quick. I mean, we have to have a plan done by the 15th of May, ready to implement on the 1st of June. We are, so we'll prepare and we will meet that deadline. And we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of work to do to examine our practices, think about the systems, the structures, the policies, all of those things that are in place that are supporting our students or aren't supporting our students, right? So that degree of equity work, trauma-informed, all of those things, we really need to do some um, scrutiny and some organization around, in my opinion. Yep. So it's both. It's sort of like a short-term response, but a long-term commitment for change as well, Caroline, in my, in my estimation. Thank you, Jen. And I, I would just add, Caroline, I think you're asking, the one of what I heard you ask was, uh, are, how does this, this equity supports designation, does it change anything that we're currently doing, right? And so uh, one thing I will say is, uh, you know, tonight's, we have a lot going on with equity after us tonight and after this presentation, but I will say that uh, Washington Central has been doing a lot of things, I think, uh, that have already been uh, pushing the bar and moving things forward in equity. Uh, and I can just, you know, we have, we're going to talk a little bit about the equity course. Uh, we have we have equity scholar and residents, which I have a recommendation uh, to continue that program, which I'm hoping the board will consider for tonight. Uh, the but the other thing is uh, is the board is also uh, did do the curriculum management review earlier this year, and one of the you know you heard Jen talk about you know looking at the structures and and how and and learning about our district and how we can really look at equity and one of the standards of that particular uh, curriculum management review that the uh, board chose and selected is equity. I mean, equity is one of the standards. So we will be getting uh, possible some recommendations and some things to look at uh, in regards to equity. So I think in many ways, uh, and I will say just full disclosure, Jen and I did meet with the Agency of Education and Jen is absolutely right that more than half of the uh, a, a majority of the uh, schools in Vermont have been designated for equity supports. And uh, even though 
Uh, they've, you know, folks have been notified of this. We were, we were told that that was the first time the person from the state was actually talking to uh, superintendent and uh, director of curriculum and instruction about equity supports because we were really interested in knowing what does this actually mean, right? So we set up a meeting uh, with this person. Maybe this is person's new to the state. I'm not sure, but uh, either way, uh, we were definitely um, really uh, interested in finding out what it is, wh wh how are schools yes. identified for equity supports, and what are the what are we what are uh, the expectations of the state? And so I think the state is also uh, learning how to do this work themselves, uh, but. Uh, Ultimately, to answer your, finally answer your question, Caroline, I think that uh, we've been designated for equity supports, but we're, we've been doing a lot of things already. And I think that uh, if, if the board will consider continuing uh, uh, with the, some of the recommendations tonight and additionally uh, consider the curriculum management review and the feedback we get from there in regards to equity, we'll have a, a, a bigger picture of what we can uh, do and what may be possible with regards to promoting equity throughout our district. Okay. Did that answer your question? So Diane and then John as you're on deck and I see you Stephen. So I, I just wanted to say that um, this is a systemic problem everywhere that we know of and didn't just happen overnight. And so um, I appreciate the, the quick part of the plan, um, but I also want to be sure, Jen, you said that, you know, we'll hopefully turn this around quickly. The reality is we're not going to be able to do that. I think it's admirable what we put into place and that we remain dedicated to doing that and to moving forward. Yes. But I think we cut ourselves short if we don't admit the hard work and the fact that it will take longer. So um, what are the short bites we take? But like you said, it's a long-term commitment. So I definitely appreciate that. But also, <clears throat> you know, I just want to be sure that while there are lots of different places, 50% that are, we need to be mindful of what we do and making sure we're doing it right and we're paying attention to it and to what the need is in our community. So um, just as a reminder for ourselves, it, it's a journey and we need to be sure that we're keeping at it and not expecting that quick fix. Jonas? Uh, Jen, really quick question. Uh, equity one is the lowest or highest level? It's the of lowest. Support needed. It's, okay, thank you. It's the lowest, yeah. Stephen Luke? Um, so I say this uh, first that I hope the administrators um, understand the sincere respect I have for the work that they're doing. Um, but to go back to some of Caroline's questions, <clears throat> um, I, th I think I've made it clear I'm results oriented. I'm not interested in what programs we've done. <clears throat> I'm not interested in um, potential. I want to see results. And I think to, to kind of tie into what Diane has said, um, we have made no appreciable improvement in our equity gap in decades, decades. Um, so I'm very impressed with the direction the administration is taking and the seriousness that they're approaching the plan now, both short-term and long-term. And I'm gonna press the board to take the same stance. Everything we consider, anything we consider needs to also be considered from an equity point of view. Every dollar we spend, we need to be thinking equity. Um, I'll just leave, leave it at that. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions from board members for Jen or Brian? Yeah, this is, this is Jonathan. I, I just had one concerning the curriculum. Does does this this uh, equity one sort of designation does that does it require uh, sort of a comprehensive review of the curriculum? And if so, does that would it include or require an equity component? in the curriculum um, that that speaks directly to 
uh, you know, underrepresented groups over time? So it, it doesn't require a, a comprehensive look at curriculum. It requires um, a goal related to safe and healthy schools related to specifically why we've been designated for Equity One. Um, but we have the opportunity to do um, as much looking and examining as we want to do and feel compelled to do. But it's not required to sort of do that broad, comprehensive look right now. Although I will say I'm very happy that the uh, board uh, did allow the curriculum management review uh, and, and, and adopted that review uh, because this will I think allow us to look uh, more closely at some of the things uh, that we may wish to address moving forward. Okay, if there are no other questions, I, I have a quick question, Jen. Uh, the, the recovery plan that you said we were submitting in May 15 is, is separate or it ties in with the, with the equity. I, I, I agree with that I totally love the recovery term. I feel like we know all teachers know when each school knows where their kids are. So we are planning to for student outcomes. Uh, so how, how are those two tie in? Uh, maybe I missed Yeah, that. so how, how can I answer this? Typically, at least um, each year or at least every other year, we would be required to engage in continuous improvement planning in general for the state and submit them to the state that is tied to some of the grants that we receive, like the consolidated federal programs, the monies that we um, spend on students who um, need additional supports or some professional learning for our schools or funding the equity course this year that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, so to, there is that requirement. This year, because schools this spring are writing the recovery plans, they, um, they're, trying to, the state is urging us to think about the recovery and CIP at the same time so that we don't have to write or update separately the continuous improvement plan because we're doing the recovery plan. And the recovery plan has a requirement to um, do a comprehensive needs assessment, sort of a look at the data that is similar, although not exactly the same as what we engage in for continu continuous improvement planning. Okay, but that would be the basis. The, where the kids are, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Brian, do you want to continue with the next? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think uh, this this is also uh, you know, the this uh, equity course. Uh, you know, Jen uh, had helped. Uh, I know it's been working with uh, at, at the in the district office to really uh, help this, and I'll let Jen talk about it. But there's a course that's been offered uh, our equity scholar in residence over at U32 has been uh, you know, teaching the course, and I'll let Jen uh, talk more about it. So I'll kick it off, but our instructor is with us right now, and I would welcome her to join us. So we are um, teaching, Shelly from Melia um, is facilitating a class for us, learning right alongside with us every single week. There are 12 of us enrolled in the class. The class is entitled Racial Equity, Intersectional Justice, and Confronting Bias at School. We are using federal funds, Title IV, which is a source of funds that can support safe and healthy schools, ultimately to help all of our students feel um, safer and to thrive in our schools and to uh, reduce incidents of bullying and harassment. So we uh, together committed to read um, Bettina Love's book, um, Oh my God, We Want to Do More Than Survive about abolitionist teaching as a foundational text. And we are doing some reading. Uh, it's an emergent curriculum as the interests um, are sparked in the class around all of these issues. It has been an absolute joy so far. We started in January. We're meeting via Zoom and, um, and we'll meet through the end of May. Shelly, what would you add to that about our class right now? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I wish more of you would, would talk about what we're doing. Um, it is an emergent curriculum. The point being for us as educators to understand the depths of who we are and what we're teaching unbeknownst to ourselves. Um, we have 
amazing conversations about the readings that we're doing. And half of the class uh, we dedicate to talking about actual practice, uh, things that have come up in the week, questions we have. We review a case studies of things that are happened at other school districts and really ask the questions that we would be probably embarrassed to ask in another forum, but we can really dig deeply into the material and, you know, ask all those questions you're afraid to ask um, and work together to see how we would resolve a problem or how, what we can help one another see more clearly. It's a very rich experience and I have to read all weekend long to keep up with them. <laughs> There are some members of the class here who might want to chime in uh, uh, if they would be so kind. And if we have time. Karen, Kelly, who else is here from the class? There are 12 of us all together. Kat, anyone want to pipe in? Sure, I'll say something. Um, I just have really um, so appreciated the district-wide nature of the group. Um, we have teachers from different levels. We have administrators from different schools. Um, we have Shelley helping us through the whole thing. It's a really rich combination. And so I'm just appreciating the structure that, that Jen helped set up and the long-term opportunity to, um, as Shelley was saying, to like engage with um, some really rich texts and also really examine our practices and have time to 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 puzzle things out and put forward dilemmas. Um, we had some things going on in a classroom that I brought to the group and um, I really got some fantastic feedback and was able to go back with um, new ideas for how to approach things. And I can't speak highly enough. I hope everyone in the district in the, you know, gets a chance to do this. I hope it becomes an ongoing tradition. It's a fabulous setup. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so uh, so uh, ultimately, I think uh, that a lot of the work that uh, Washington Central has been engaged in uh, regarding equity, I, I'm, recommend, I'm gonna be recommending again uh, uh, that that continue. But I'm also, uh, I also think doing that in conjunction with looking at what is possible when we get the results of the curriculum management review, uh, I think when you put those two things hand in hand, we could get a really good blueprint for moving how to move forward uh, with uh, with equity as a part of the overall strategic plan. Uh, and so I think there's some really op great opportunities. I know we have an action-packed agenda tonight, and we do have some guests here that I did invite uh, to uh, present. So I, I see Shelly's here. Uh, where's Erica and Lucinda? I, I'll turn it over to you uh, to make uh, to talk about the Equity Scholar and Residence Program. Uh, and as you're as you're getting ready to put the uh, PowerPoint up, I just want to let uh, the school board know that this program has been offered at Washington at U32, and sometimes uh, goes in, is uh, Shelley's on borrow on loan to some of the other schools, but she's really uh, focused on at U32. And uh, part of the proposal uh, that we're asking the board to consider for tonight uh, to support is to use the equity scholar and, pro scholar and residence program, not at the school level uh, at U32, but also across the entire district starting for next year. So I'll uh, turn that over to the group. I see some folks here. So Erica. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm Erica Zimmerman. I'm a resident of East Montpelier and a U32 parent. But I'm here as the new, newish uh, executive director of Washington Central Friends of Education, which has been the longtime nonprofit partner to the school districts. And um, I'm really excited to be here. Having been asked, Washington, uh, WCFE has been asked to be the incubator and the fiscal agent for the Equity Scholar in Residence program in its next year. Um, the board has received our proposal as well as this presentation. I'm going to go over it very quickly um, and mostly leave time for you to ask questions of Shelly Vermilia, who is our 
equity scholar in residence at U32. Um, and Lucinda Garthwaite, <coughs> excuse me, who has developed this project, this uh, model as the director of the Institute for Liberatory Innovation. Um, so, um, and I'll just introduce Washington Central Friends of Education, you may know as an incubator for past new projects in Washington Central, including branching out and community connections. And we're very excited to take on that role again here. So um, slide, please. As Brian and Jen have discussed with you tonight, and as you've read, I'm sure um, a lot, school equity is a powerful predictor of school success. And in fact, social inequities are a, a disappointing and, and, and upsetting predictor for lack of school success. And it's really no different in Vermont than it is nationally. Slide, please. We know that we have students of color, students with disabilities and other historically marginalized populations who are not succeeding as well as the historically privileged population. And we know that we need to engage with this challenge. There's no way it's going to get better unless we engage in it. Slide, please. We are really fortunate that U32 signed on as the partner in piloting a new model developed by ILI, the Institute for Liberatory Innovation, to help teachers develop competence, ed educators, I should say, teachers and administrators and staff, develop competence and confidence in engaging in challenges of equity. It's a brand new model. It has been piloted in the past to this current school year and the year before at U32 with a few fingers into other schools. Um, it has been piloted without expense to the district so far. And we're very proud to say that our district will always be known as its home. It is starting to garner statewide interest and interest beyond. And we are excited and compelled to offer it to the district as a whole. Slide, please. I should not be the one to say too much about the model. I want you to be able to ask questions of Shelley, Lucinda, and educators who have worked with Shelley. But I do want you to think about one concept. Imagine that we have a full-time independent scholar with expertise in equity, expertise that has been cultivated through scholarship and through experience, who is full-time five days a week with our educators, able to sit alongside them, have tough conversations, delve into research, help frame the actual questions, which sometimes are hard to even get your head around. To, to address these challenges of why are some students experiencing inequity in our schools? What does that look like? What can we do? What is out there that can help us? It's a relationship-based model. The, the equity scholar in residence develops relationships with our educators, knows our school culture, and is responsive to the questions that come up. Having a resource like this is innovative, it's unique, and we're excited to see how it would look to expand from one school, U32, into the district as a whole. Slide, please. We have begun to evaluate, I shouldn't say we, the Institute for Liberatory Innovation has begun to evaluate the efficacy of this model there's a third party evaluation that will be complete by the end of this May. But to date, we've, they, uh, there've been pilot surveys of educators which show resounding success. There's some evidence of sustained change beyond an individual educator's experience. And um, 
and some perspectives that show that there is reduced resistance to engaging in learning in these challenges that have historically been hard for all of us to engage in, what, no matter what our role is. Slide, please. So it's really teachers' voices, educators' voices that are most important to help you understand the model and, to, and its potential um, for the district as a whole. Um, Hank Van Orman was supposed to be here tonight to speak to this, but unfortunately for us, but fortunately for U32, we have a basketball team in the playoffs right now. So he could not be here. He is serving his role as director of athletics, and he was very sorry to write in just before that he couldn't be here. And it looks like, um, is Mary Bove here? I'm not sure if she is here. I didn't see her before. Someone, no. So I think she must have had something come up as well. Um, I believe there's a bunch of educators here and school administrators who have worked with Shelly who can, who might want to speak to the, um, to their experience in working with the Equity Scholar in Residence. Don't want to put you on the spot, but it's a friendly group. Um, I can't see you all right now, but I'm wondering if anyone can monitor and look for any hands up. You can also join in at the end uh, if you see want. See Jody uh, raising her hand. Oh, that, and Kat. And I, and I see Kat. Right. Kat, do you want to go ahead? Oh, there's Jody. I guess. Yeah, I, I'm happy to start. Um, I am new to this work. I feel like um, uh, that very uh, grateful that the folks in our group are open to, um, especially Shelly, who's just amazing, who meets us all like we do with our students wherever we're at and brings us into the fold and doesn't tell us what to think and inspires the vulnerability and the, um, the and places to go with our learning so that we feel like we can really engage in this. Um, I, I have had the opportunity in the past to pull Shelly aside and ask, you know, present her with a dilemma and, um, that comes up in my work. And just this week, I, I feel like I, I put myself out there with the group and said, you know, I've had this issue around, um, student, uh, response to challenging behavior. And I started out talking about our, uh, elementary model for our discipline procedures and our handbook and just talked about the challenges about we don't have a racial equity lens in our procedures and the way that we might with a trauma-informed approach or restorative practices. And um, I was looking for like just some support around how to gain more knowledge. And what I got was some, some folks telling me that you know, I need to be thinking about even the vocabulary of discipline, that that's such a, you know, a deficit model and punitive, and it keeps those, you know, those um, barriers in place. And it, it didn't feel like I was attacked at all. It felt like I was being inspired to sort of like raise up and talk about being an activist. And I'm like, what? I don't know how to do that. They said I could. I'm doing it. Um, this is great work to be engaged in. And Shelly is a gift to our district. We need to figure out how to keep her. Thank you, Kat. And you're, Kat, just, you're the principal of Callis. So somehow mm -hmm. you've um, been able to work with Shelly across yep. the outside of U32. Yes. Yeah, great, thanks. <sighs> Anybody else? Jody, did you want to say something? Sure. I would say that um, I was lucky enough to work with Shelly when she first started with us and actually when she proposed, she and Lucinda proposed this venture. And it's been wonderful to observe Shelly work with faculty and staff in professional development, but also individually. And of course, I know about the um, learning that's going on in this course. And the, the questions that she gets to grapple with, with our faculty and staff, and also with students in different clubs that she helps to participate. She participates in those and she listens to the students and she hears what, what they're struggling with and brings that back 
to our educators and to myself and other administrators. And it's just great to have her voice asking, I think I heard you say, Erica, some of the hard questions. Um, and those questions aren't always easy for any of us to answer, but that's okay. It gives us an opportunity to really think about what's going on and to consider how we might do things differently to support our students. And it's been wonderful to work with Shelly. Thank you, Jody. Let me, um, let's see, I think I can, I'll go on to just tell you a little bit more about the model, or sorry, about our proposal. And then we'll go back to and open up to questions. So if we could go back to the PowerPoint, please. Thank you. So um, as many of you know, Washington Central Friends of Education is a nonprofit that can partner, that is, its mission includes partnering with the school district to help house and incubate and develop new projects that either need to be independent of the school district or have the potential for moving into the school district. But in its, their early stages, it's more, um, we're more nimble and um, to be able to offer fiscal management and oversight and liability protection, et cetera. And uh, on the, our call tonight, you'll see a couple of our um, longtime leaders, Deb Wolf, who's my predecessor, and Ginny Burley, who's uh, the founding and founder and director of Community Connections for so many years. Um, and they, as, uh, along with a couple others on the call, are our uh, comprise the majority of our current board. So they can help make sure that I guide this uh, process in the successful way it has operated before. Um, it's important for the equity scholar model that the scholar be independent. And um, by us serving as the fiscal agent, it will enable the scholar to, be, to remain in that uh, relationship with the school district. Um, the costs are close to $80,000, $79,000 um, for the 2021 school year, which would enable uh, the equity scholar to be full-time for the entire year. As um, we said, we would be exploring how to move the model from being one school based to being district wide. And how can the equity scholar serve and meet the needs of teachers from and, and leaders from all the schools, um, as well as helping the district leadership with equity policy and curriculum. Um, as I said, we Washington Central Friends of Education would enter a MOU relationship with the school district. And uh, we would take the lead on working towards the future of the equity scholar in the district. While at the same time, the ILI, the, the uh, founder of the model will be working to expand it to other sites into a long-term future and to allow for continuous evaluation um, as the model shifts, especially from being one school based to seeing how it can work district-wide. That, um, those are the basics. I'm sure there are questions. Thank you for showing the PowerPoint, Jim. And um, I believe, I wanna just make sure we have still, we have Shelly, we have Lucinda Garthwaite, um, and we have members of our board, but more importantly, we have educators and administrators who have worked with the Equity Scholar and have a sense of how the model plays out and can be useful in addressing these really critical equity challenges. Scott, go ahead. Laura, would you permit me to make a motion to, um, to, is that, would that be in order yeah, at this point? Uh, yeah, okay. go ahead and do the motion, yeah. Then I'll move to authorize a contract for the Equity Scholar in Residence with the Washington Central Friends of Education at a cost not to exceed $79,184 
for the 2021-22 school year and to use the fund balance to pay for this. Thank you, Scott. A, a second? Second. Thank you, I missed that. It was that you, Jonas? Yeah, I. Chris. Yeah, okay, good. A, discussion, so now we can go ahead and do more questions because I know, I see Chris, you had your hand up. I do. Um, um, Erica, can you tell us what it means um, to be independent? It's independent of whom and, and how the independence would work within the structure of the school district. I'll speak to that from the, the structural side and then um, perhaps Lucinda or Shelley would want to speak to it from the model side. Structurally, um, the equity scholar would be an employee of Washington Central Friends of Education and WCFE would offer oversight both for the efficacy of this role and for making sure that the, the equity scholar works within the school's policies um, and practices and that the relationship, you know, works, keeps going in a good direction. Um, so we would have the, um, we would be essentially backing up the district to making sure that it is going in the direction that we want it, that the district wants it to go. Um, meanwhile, ILI will be examining and supporting the model as it's developing into its third year. Um, but I think maybe Shelley or Lucinda or, or us, perhaps one of the school leaders could speak to the value of this role as being independent. Um, of the of the schools and of the district. Jody or Stephen, do you want to jump in there, or do you want me to say something first? Either you way, are. it's fine. Yeah. Stephen, I, I was saying, if you'd like to speak first, that's great. Well, what we've what we have begun to understand, and again, as Erica said, hello everybody, by the way, um, as Erica said, the the full third party evaluation will be finished in May. But we have done already done some research, and what we've realized is that that um, Christopher, the independence, as in they're not a school employee, lets mm -hmm. them be pretty nimble, and and that's really what defines the independence. They're not a school employee, so uh, one could say it's a contractual relationship, a consulting relationship, but they're not a consultant either. So we don't like to say that. Um, so that what that means is that the, is they're free to leave their desk and go down the hall and deal with what's happening. There's, they're not stuck with the, or they're not uh, limited by the strictures of being a, a school employee. And, and that was something we've heard from administrators of from leaders of school has been a pretty important part of the model for them, which is why if, if Steven or Jody wants to speak to it, they can speak to it more on the ground. But um, it, it is one of the pieces that we've asked our evaluator to really look at, to, to really affirm it. Um, but it is what is emerging as a, a critical part of the model. Did I answer your question, Christopher? Well enough? You did. But, yes. And, and if you, you don't mind me. Yeah, and if you don't mind me adding on to that, the um, I think what's really important is that this role needs to be in a position where it's not beholden to administration for anything, so that it can speak truth to power is really what it's about, and that's what we are are really um, excited about. I mean, I wouldn't ask for something like this normally in a school until you realize how powerful it can be. Um, to have your equity coordinator not having to uh, be supervised by the people that they are actually helping deal with those equity issues. And so I think that it's a great model um, for, for this kind of role. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Kari and Scott, you're on deck. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to, I'm supportive of the proposal. My, my, um, Curiosity is around the impact, and I know it's early on, and I know that we're going to get more information after the report in May, but I wonder if you can share some thoughts about how we will in, in, be thinking about success down the road. And if you can put yourself in our shoes, when we get to budgeting, whether that's in the fall of 21 or a couple years down the road, what are the kinds of things that we ought to be looking at to, to judge whether this program has been successful and we want to continue it? I can take that, Carrie. Thank you. Um, we're a research institute. So we started with a research question. 
And, and that research question was based on prior research, uh, which tells us that if we can move the needle on educators' confidence and willingness to engage equity, then we're going to move the needle on equitable school cultures, and we're going to move the needle on school equity. Um, there, there's plenty of research background, although I'm not a person that's really good at tripping that off the top of my head, but I can certainly provide you all with it if, if you'd like it. Um, so we started by saying, if we use this model, and you've all seen the model, I can answer questions about it, will we move the needle on educators' confidence and willingness to engage equity? And the, the work we did last year, we got about a third, it was pandemic time and it was a very busy staff. Still, we got a third of the educators reporting back and as you saw, 96% of the people that worked with the equity scholars said, yeah, I'm feeling like I can do this more than I used to feel like I could do it. So, so for starters, we're always gonna be looking at that. Are we seeing a measurable, and Stephen, to your question, a measurable impact on educators' uh, willingness and confidence to address, uh, to both respond to, respond to and proactively address equity, right? So we, and the way we're measuring that in the evaluation is we're using, we're using a survey, we did a pretest, we're doing a post-test and we have an external person coming in and she's interviewing 15 or 20 people. Jody's helping her with that. I, I hired her, but I'm not, I'm, I'm hands off. Um, so that's how we're going to find that out. Now, going into the future, what's begun to emerge, and we'll find out more about this in our evaluation, is what Erica talked about. We may also find out we can measure sustained change and uh, reduced resistance to working with equity. Both of those things also, prior research tells us, will drive an equitable school culture. What, the, what we will not be able to measure as a direct result is changes in school culture and changes in school's performance, right? Because and changes in students' performance, because this is not, um, we we aren't we aren't pushing that lever. We're pushing the lever of of educators' capacity to respond to and proactively address issues of equity. Um, I, this is an opportunity for me to say, as I as I shared with Brian, I as the director of the ILI am a little concerned about about moving into a district-wide application with one person, Shelly is saying, I think I could do it, let's try. So we're saying, let's give it a go. And we're really, really grateful that the district is, is open to the possibility of giving this a go. Our commitment from the ILI is to raise the funds to really evaluate that carefully and make sure it works. It still drives that critical lever of increasing capacity. Did I answer your question, Carrie? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lucinda. It, Scott and Diane, you're on deck. Unmute, Scott. Thank you. Um, I had the privilege to get to know uh, Shelley, and actually, maybe I should say I was non marginalized in getting to know Shelley. In, um, in another context and getting a sense of her as a person and of her skills and um, you know the, the depth of her learning and understanding. And um, I, I completely uh, get what has been said about the, um, the experience that our educators have had with her. And I think it's extremely valuable um, and I support it as well. Um, with reference to Kari's question and to Diane and, and Stephen, look, um, before him too, um, as a fan of digital humanities, um, I noticed that in this board packet, the word equity occurs actually 86 times. Um, inequity, the word inequity, um, a handful of times as well. Uh, the words equality and inequality um, occur both zero times, although equal twice. Um, what concerns me is that all of, all of this great effort um, is being conducted in the context of massive and intensifying wealth and income inequality in our country and in, in Vermont. Um, as well. So uh, there's, um, there's a background to, um, to all of this that um, I'm not saying that we're, we're spinning into a gale force wind, but um, 
because I think there, again, there's real uh, value that will come through in having um, better educators, um, teachers, administrators, staff, who are better able to manage the problems that arise out of this, you know, um, extremely difficult and seemingly worsening context. But um, so I, I hope that we don't uh, we don't try to you know um, expect too much, uh, and that we look for um, you know improvements in in the individuals that that Shelley will be working with, and in their skills and their um, and, and the results that you know maybe even on a kind of micro level they're able to achieve. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Diane? So a couple of questions. Um, one, is there a thought about a critical mass? That is there a number that is kind of a goal to be sure to have touch points with in terms of, of moving that needle? And then the other, and this might be too early in the process, but certainly when you have one person hired for the whole district, uh, wondering how it is gonna be an equitable share that doesn't dilute the process in in that way. And so just figuring out how Shelly will divvy her her time so that it's a sustainable model that isn't really just hinged on her incredible skills. So I'm gonna, I'll say a couple of things, Diane, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Shelly for a minute. Um, I, I, you're, you are, you are, Speak in my mind in terms of a, a, the it's a question, not so much. I'm not, I'm not, I am not convinced that it won't work. I am a researcher, so I'm asking if it will, right? Um, and uh, we, we don't know what the, we, the answer to your, the direct answer to your question is no, we do not know how many touch points it, it takes to make this happen. Down the road, we may have the resources to be able to measure that, but we don't know. And we right now don't have plans to measure that particular data point. Um, but it's a really interesting thought. So I appreciate it because maybe it's something we're gonna pick up down the road when we get more funding. Um, but so thank you for that. The, the second question is what we're gonna, what the ILI is gonna do is, is um, we have some funders interested in helping us to continue to investigate the efficacy of the model. And we're gonna say, all right, we're, we're doing, it's almost like a third year of a pilot. We're gonna see what, what happens when we do this. And we'll come back to the board and say, you know, last year we got 96%, this year we only got 70. So maybe we need to think about another resource. And let me just say that the ILI is very busy working with some funders to um, this summer will be, once we get the results of the evaluation, we'll be figuring out how to replicate this. We're One of the first questions that Jody and Steven, a lot of people have asked is, can we replicate this if we don't have Shelly Vermilia doing it? And we are beginning to find out, yeah, we're beginning to realize, yeah, we can. It has to do with very careful hiring and training and mentoring, um, which, Shelly will have a role in. But let me just say, I know Shelly has some thoughts about how she's gonna approach this. And so I wanna turn it over to Shelly to say, to let her answer your question about how she's gonna approach this challenge. Well, sort of like it, everything you, um, you know, you offer what's possible and see who comes. Um, the reason I think, uh, it's possible to do the district is my experience this year with um, Romney. And I don't know if any Romney folks are here, but we've been doing um, regular professional development sessions and the conversation grows and more and more people understand what we're talking about as, as we have consistent um, monthly meetings. And I think that is how to grow this. Person by person, uh, understanding that this is hard work and it's really great work when you're doing it, especially when you're doing it with colleagues. Um, the energy just sort of bubbles when you have five people thinking about a problem and coming up with five different ideas. So I don't have a prescription. I have a willingness to have these conversations with as many people as possible, but it has to, it is kind of slow and it's kind of, um, and then it cascades. 
Um, so that's what I think we do. And I'll work, I would really like to work with Jen Miller Arsenault on the way to do this too, because it's got curriculum uh, impact. So I think there are enough of us already doing this uh, that if we work a little more tightly together, um, we'll really be able to, to create some great communication and possibilities for our students. Thank you, Shelley. Virginia, you have, uh, Ginny, do you have something to share? You have your hand is up. Yeah, I do. Um, as, a, as a member of uh, Friends of Education, I am really excited and committed to the work that's going on here and, and fully support it. Um, another hat that I wear is a member of Vermont After School, which is the organization that has done so much work to provide services for kids and families in COVID in just setting up all of the systems that allow kids to have places to go and systems that work. And um, they've gotten a ton of attention. I'm actually planning to bring this concept to them because I think that equity is an issue that should be at the top of their wish list. And um, I don't know where that's gonna go, but that's a statewide organization. And I think this is perfect to bring to them. Uh, they've done a lot of work on social emotional learning, on family support, and equity is where they, where I as a board member think they should be spending some of our energy. So just wanted to let you know that. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, Stephen Book. Um, I, I think we could have a, a brilliant, informative, wonderful discussion on this topic for hours. I'd like to call the question and yeah, vote the, on the motion on the floor. Yeah, so we'll call the, the question. And I, I just wanted to make a quick comment. I know that the question has been called, but I just want to thank everybody that came. This is super excited that we're going to, you know, hopefully, depending on how the motion goes, uh, we will be able to do this work across uh, pre-K to, to 12. This is just really a historic moment in our district. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, all the favor in the motion, uh, say yes or aye. Yes. Aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Hearing none, the motion passed. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'm honored to you. take up this work with uh, with the district. And we couldn't ask. We have an all-star team of partners to to make this a reality. Yeah. And Thank I'll you be all here for coming tonight. tonight. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for the work you, you do, all of you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Take care. Let's, thank you. Let's, let's move. Um, you have one more Yes, point. I have one Brian, more in my report, uh, and I'll make it quick. I just want to, this is actually a really exciting opportunity. Uh, this is from the uh, Vermont Superintendents Association. It's the Instructional Leadership Academy. Uh, what it is, is uh, it's not offered every year. It's going to be offered next year. It was offered a few years ago. Uh, I did uh, contact some superintendents about it. Uh, they uh, sent uh, one or two principals and themselves and maybe a central office person to participate a few years ago. Now they, they said it was so good in how they developed their leadership teams and uh, came up with uh, how to really uh, develop and design and continue and share leadership practices amongst each other when it comes to improving instruction in schools, in their schools, that they decided that they now all wanted to uh, bring their entire leadership team. Uh, and so what happened is I actually had to uh, advocate uh, for the v with the VSA for them to open up a second cohort because uh, they... It, 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 it opened on one day and it closed less than 24 hours later. And I was like, I hadn't had a chance to talk to my leadership team yet. And when I did talk, uh, there was a lot, there was a, a lot of uh, interest on the leadership team. So uh, we are uh, looking forward to participating in this program next year. Uh, I can talk more about it another night. I know we have a full action packed agenda, but uh, the idea here is it will start in the fall. It will continue throughout the year. We will, uh, it will involve principals and central office leaders and myself to visit each other's schools, to do walkthroughs and learn how to do this work in a collaborative type of way. 
uh, uh, and we will also learn how to do this going to other school districts throughout the state of Vermont to look and learn about best practices that are happening and while also learning about some instructional leadership frameworks. Okay. Thank you, Brian. That concludes uh, the report. Uh, we're going to move into education quality. I um, wonder if everybody wants to a break while they put the presentation and then we power through the rest of the uh, agenda. With that, did everybody need a, just a quick break? Sure. Yep. Five. So we'll be back in, yeah, in, in five minutes. Okay. Thank you. 51. See you soon. Okay, welcome everybody. I'll pass on the education quality discussion to Jen and Kari. Yeah, so hi everybody. Um, this month we're gonna continue our journey through the student learning outcomes and we're talking about literacy. And um, like math last month, this is a topic just fundamental to our mission. And um, we don't have a lot of time tonight. We hope everyone comes away with a better understanding of our literacy curriculum and the instruction and some of the achievement data. The uh, committee got a, another excellent overview um, and the, the full set of slides is in the packet. And Jenna's gonna share some of the highlights in just a moment. And I just wanted to add that um, this month we uh, try, as a committee used the Jamboard, which is a shared web page to gather our questions and our discussion points. So if you want to take a look at those, you can review those. Just um, click on the Jamboard that's in the link that's in the packet. So um, you want to take it away, Jen? Sure. So I'm going to share my screen again and talk you through just a few of our slides here. Oh, let me advance from down here. So again, um, I, We've been trying to, to come up with a reliable, uh, reliable and predictable kind of format for these presentations. Here are the literacy standards. Um, you can see that we have standards related to reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And all of our standards are aligned uh, with the Common Core state standards. Here's an example of um, just the learning progression and scales, pre-K all the way through graduation. So, you know, what we expect um, for our youngest students as they're being emergent writers, um, really appreciating story as a, and drawing as a way to tell a story all the way um, through. This SNP actually doesn't show all the grades, but um, that this is our, informs our thinking. There are a lot of slides and examples about some instruction this year. I'm not going to go over all of them, but I want you to just take note as you're looking at those links that um, we've gotten creative this year. We've had to, and it's been fabulous. So reading and writing and listening and speaking can happen indoors, and they can happen outdoors, and they can happen remotely or via um, our electronic devices and the internet. So there are some examples. Um, if you haven't yet had an opportunity to really read some of these examples, and actually in your packet, I know the print is small, I do encourage you to spend a few minutes. Um, there's some really rich examples of our students' work and their interests, and some links again to get more in depth. Um, Kari mentioned we this is an, a student learning outcome area in which we have a lot of data. And so slides 9 through 18 in the slideshow um, are all related to our student performance data. You will notice that um, in as in the past, we do have, um, and like we talked about earlier, differences in, um, in performance among various student groups. There's one data slide that I want to highlight for you tonight, and members of the Ed Quality Committee or board members who joined us for this meeting earlier this month, you'll notice that um, our this slide had been incomplete. We had just administered the winter administration of the BAS in February, our benchmark assessment system. In grades, uh, this slide is one through six, and we didn't have all of the data noted. And so for tonight's meeting, we do have all of the data. And so what you're seeing is our data from two administrations last year, so pre-pandemic, 
um, in, in each of those grade levels. We did not administer the BAS in the spring last year. That was pretty impossible to do uh, remotely during a period of school dismissal. And so far we've administered it in the fall and then in the winter. And I want you to note um, in particular, the blue line and the yellow line, this is a change in our practice. So we have been super intentional, I think, from last spring and really clear about the fact that we did not want our students to be penalized because they were in a situation of uh, a global pandemic of which they had no control. And we wanted to meet our kids where they are and support them not only academically, but socially and emotionally. And so the curriculum instruction and assessment reopening task force spent a lot of time this summer um, thinking about how to how to reopen school in a way that um, that held all of those realities together, and um, and it impacted our local comprehensive assessment plan. So I want you to know that we decided that. Um, in the winter, our expectation for right now is different than it would have been had we not missed six months of school. So what we're expecting now um, is, is a slightly uh, lower level of expectation than in typical times. That's the blue line. The yellow line is what we would have expected had we not been in a pandemic. Another important thing to note is that in the past, we have not universally administered the benchmark assessment system in the spring. We've only administered it um, or sort of required administration if students hadn't met the winter benchmark. This year, we are um, asking our teachers to administer the spring assessment universally. So we really have a gauge over the course of the, the entire year. Um, we really wanted to give our kids the space and our teachers the space and the time that they needed to continue growing. So I just wanna be clear about that and, um, and transparent. The final thing I wanna say before you all um, talk and Kari takes over again is, um, is just a little bit of this analysis of data. So as you can see, um, our literacy scores tend to be higher than our math scores. We've talked about differences in performance. Um, I want you to know also one factor could be the amount of time that we're devoting to instruction. We devote at least 90 minutes to literacy in our elementary schools. Um, you, if you look at that data more closely, you'll see that there's some measures that are indicating a difference in performance um, pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. We're really paying attention to that. And as part of our plan for recovery and redesign, we'll be um, thinking about that. Um, we are wondering about our writing practices. Um, we do have in the elementary schools a common, some common rubrics and, and um, assessments, some prompts, but we are wondering if it's time now to take a look at that practice. We haven't examined it in a number of years and, um, and should, we, uh, should we update our practices? And finally, um, as you well know, and as is happening in the legislature right now as well, there's a lot of research and evidence and conversation about um, what has been called the science of reading and um, to what extent might that um, and should that inform our practices and our examination of our practices. So um, that in a really quick way is a nutshell and I'll pass it back to Kari. Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> so um, again, we don't have a ton of time, but is there maybe one or two clarifying questions about the information you just got or something else that's in the packet or not in the packet? Um, if not our question for you, and again, I'm just to frame this up, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for us to be focusing on on this um, over the course of the year. But one that's um, uh, important is to inform our strategic planning, right? We're going through all of the student learning outcomes, getting a degree of fluency so that we know what to prioritize. And I think that's going to be one of the big challenges with, with strategic planning is what, what are we going to focus on and what are we not going to prioritize? So. Um, in that spirit, here's, here's our question for you. Um, what information from this review do you want to carry forward into our strategic planning so that, it, that it's um, part of the mix that gets considered when we start? Anybody got a thought about that? Don't 
Diane, please. So, so one of the things too I wanted to mention was that we as a committee have noted as well that we're not able to do the deep dive that would be needed. So this is kind of a tr tricky question to answer because we haven't really been able to dig deep. And so um, it's our hope that maybe with the changing up of having committees have more time that we can really, um, instead of staying at the 30,000 foot level, really dive in, um, which to me would then inform how does that fit in our strategic planning. Fair enough. Thank you. Stephen? I would ask if the committee could look at, as you examine the, the performance in the various student learning outcomes, uh, which outcomes have the greatest equity gap? Got it. Thank you. Anybody? Caroline? Really similar to Stevens. I would just um, use the data to also see, was there a grade level more affected by last spring than another? Um, it, it may or may not be from that, but looking at the BAS scores, it just seems like first grade, fourth grade and fifth grade have more disparity of where they were last winter versus this winter. And just using that maybe for decisions around um, supports. Thank you. But definitely Thank looking you. more than I just did and determining if that's accurate, not taking it as a mandate. Got it. Floor, you, you have something? Sorry, I was not able to Thank unmute you. myself quickly enough. It just carrying it, uh, if, uh, page 56 with the seventh grade literacy star it, that the segregated the poverty and the IEP was and um, was important. It's really hard to see, and we always wanted to like figure out how to see those dots better. But that's something, and I don't know, if we can desegregate it, it even even more sort of in line uh, heard in the at the beginning of the of the presentation so like um, uh, the two the two main uh, um, what I'm going to call them um, so by race too not just uh, so so do do a deeper dive you know to desegregate that data and and carry that through as we do the uh, the continuous improvement plan can you hear me my internet says unstable yeah, okay, that's it. Yeah, we got it, thank you. So I think that's probably close to time. And thank you very much. And just want to remind folks that the um, open invitation stands. If you want to join us, we have a couple more student learning outcomes on the calendar. Science is next, and then health and phys ed. And we will be meeting at 5 p.m., uh, I believe. We're gonna continue doing that 5 p.m. at the first uh, Wednesday of the month, and um, hopefully we'll have a little bit more time, as Diane says. So thank you. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Jen. And you had three minutes to go, so thank you. <laughs> Let's move into the next. Uh, yeah. Oh, Finance Committee. So technology uh, 4.41, uh, the technology bid that was in page 68, I'm wondering, it, it was not a part of our package, but I wonder if Scott or, or Carrie has it in front of them and could make a motion to award. I, I'm happy to read it unless you have it in front of you, Scott. Go ahead. Thanks, Laura. I would move to award the storage and virtualization bid to Cambridge Computer in the amount of $189,499. Could I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. A second. A, and that was open for discussion. Are there any questions? I'm, I'm happy to describe that quickly. And Jim is here if we had any questions. It is in the packet. It's in the most recent packet floor. So there is a description about it. But yeah, there's the whole description. I just didn't see the motion. There. It was at the bottom. 
I yeah, just wanted to yeah. thank Jim for all the detail in this. It made it really easy to come tonight after having all of that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Stephen Luke. Um, I would just ask, um, I see this as another, uh, the uh, fund balance is going to be used to pay for this. Um, I, I would ask that we keep a, a running tab on what we're approving from the fund balance, particularly in light of the discussion that we had during executive session. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions? And Lori, do you want to? Yes, I just wanted to reiterate that technology has its own fund balance where we've tried to level budget for many years and save um, any unspent money for purchases like this so that we didn't have spikes in the budget. So it, the technology department has its own tech um, reserve fund balance separate from the operating fund balance. And as Jim um, alluded to that in the memo, there's about 358,000 in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so all those in favor approving the motion read by Scott, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. So let's move on. Thank you, uh, school board, and thank you, Jim, for your leadership. Thank you, everybody. So the, the, the next item is the capital timeline, the uh, review, and then the facilities director update. Uh, Brian Munner, you want to just quickly give an update on facilities director? It was part of your package. But yeah, just so we're, we, we, uh, we have, I, mean, I, I don't know if Carl is still here, but uh, we, ba we basically have been, uh, uh, you know, we, we put, we propose things out there, cast a wide net. Uh, we'll, we'll be setting up the interview committee, a hiring committee, and uh, we'll uh, just follow the same, the same uh, structure that we've been using for other positions uh, that we've been looking to fill this year. And it's been posted. It should be closing uh, within the next two weeks, uh, and then uh, we'll be able to uh, ultimately uh, start that hiring process. Thank you, Brian. And then, as you could see on page eighty, the the timeline is pretty compact and compressed for the capital projects. So I'm going to ask again: Is we make the next motion? Do you have it right in front of you? I have it on page 81. Yes, please. I make a motion to authorize the WCUUSD Finance Committee to award bids on capital projects as necessary for the remainder of the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, could I have a second? Second. Uh, we can have discussion. Any any questions? Just do a quick uh, description. That might uh, all we're trying to do is stay ahead of uh, like we did before. Uh, it's really hard to have contractors this uh, at this point through COVID. So if we stayed ahead, we would be able to get the contractors some time and be able to also get any funds that come from Efficiency Vermont. So if you see the timeline, uh, we try to line them up. Uh, the Finance Committee meets on Tuesdays, so we have uh, reserved three days to be able to award the bids and continue the work um, and not lose a possible contractor. So any other, any questions besides? So let's move ahead and vote. All those in favor approving the motion as read by Caroline, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, aye. please say no. Hearing none opposed, the ayes have it. The motion carries. Uh, 4.44, uh, we are gonna table the electric um, Charger for, for today, uh, we're pending in a little bit more information that Jim is gonna gather uh, for, for, for us. Okay. So moving right to 4.45, House Ways and Means Testimony. 
Uh, Lori, do you want to say a few words about this? Do you want me to describe it? Sure. Um, Go ahead. So basically, we had touched on this a while back that I had requested um, that Jana Ansel um, explore um, extending merger benefits to districts that had involuntarily merged. Um, and what we found from doing that process at the state was that it really affected all districts. And so what that meant was there were a couple benefits that even, for example, um, the Burlington School District wouldn't be eligible for um, because of the way the statute had been written. So at this time, um, we are expecting that this will pass in the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, they are adding it to a different bill. So H31 is kind of combined with an, another bill. Um, but we should see the continuation of merger support grants for small schools grant. Um, the actual amount is still being recalculated. It may be a little less than last year, um, but the good news is, is that this would be then a guaranteed amount every year going forward, and we wouldn't be subject to having the amount recalculated and being found ineligible. So that was good news about the small schools merger grant. Um, the other part of the testimony was with regard to a hold harmless provision in the time of declining enrollment. And so I was able to testify on that. And um, it sounds like that's also something that's going to be favorable and that the House Ways and Means Committee expects to pass through this miscellaneous bill that they're working on. Um, the state financial software update. Um, there is testimony continuing and I actually testified this afternoon and I haven't sent you yet my testimony, uh, but I was asked to testify on behalf of the business managers in the state uh, because it was a short notice. And basically the business managers in the state um, are asking for a pause in the e-finance software conversion. Additionally, they are seeking um, having the bill, imp uh, how do I say this? The business managers are requesting the state reconsider making this software mandatory um, the business managers all uh, joined together in doing a survey and said that they feel that the software should be optional. And so that was the basis of my testimony today on behalf of VASBO and also on behalf of our district. And I also had served on a committee who prepared the bid specifications. So what you'll see when I send out my testimony is more information about why this vendor was not actually the lowest cost vendor. And the fact of the matter is, is that this software is not saving the state money. So more information is getting collected as we speak. Um, and at this time, they are asking for at minimum of a six month pause from the Agency of Education and the Finance Committee uh, discuss this with me and ask that I try to get Washington Central and the last possible cohort group, group to use the software using this extension. Uh, so Washington Central would be um, probably expected to go live by the end of December 2022 instead of July 1, 2022. If the software is found to not meet the expectations and the needs, the Agency of Education has said that they will revisit this um, requirement for the software, I guess, in concert with the legislature. So that's what I know about those two items. Thank you so much, Lori. And includes the Finance uh, Committee part of the meeting. Uh, let's move right into policy, uh, Christopher. Uh, Chris, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Flora. Um, so we have up for first reading a revision, a significant revision to um, um, policy number F46, which is the flag raising policy. Uh, the committee worked um, pretty hard on this revision um, and consulted with uh, Bernie Lambeck, um, a, uh, an attorney who works for our district. Uh, and what we asked Bernie to do, and, and uh, uh, kudos to Brian, uh, because he brought this to our attention, wondering whether or not we might be um, exposing ourselves to uh, potential litigation. Uh, but Bernie made these recommendations with based on the, the basic foundation of um, instead of having a flag policy that reflected student speech, it actually became the board speech. Um, and the reason for that was to uh, prevent the flagpole from becoming a limited public forum. Um, because if it became a limited public forum, uh, then the board would have to um, allow under the First Amendment um, other student speech that we may not be supportive of. 
And so Bernie basically helped us revise the, the policies so that um, it, we were very emphasizing that um, any flag that goes up on the board, uh, on the flagpole uh, through the board's approval policy is board speech um, and not student speech. So it, it creates a layer of, of protection for us from a First Amendment perspective. Um, so this is a first reading. Um, and in keeping, in addition to amending the policy, uh, Bernie uh, went through and, and uh, recommended changes to the procedure uh, for the flag raising, um, um, our flag raising procedure as well. So any comments or observations about, um, we will start with the policy first, um, about uh, F46 and the changes that are being proposed to it with this first reading. Scott? Okay, hearing. Oh. We couldn't hear you, uh, sir. If I may. Um, thanks. I, I think it's very good. I, I just have one observation. I don't know if there's much that can be done about it, but in the fourth bullet under criteria, that, that's sort of an interesting combination of adjectives, vulgar, religious, commercial. Um, somehow, it just seems a little bit incongruous, um, but I don't know if uh, if there's a better way to to put it. Is one of these things not like the other, Scott? One of these so, things do you have not like the other. Do you have a comment on which one should might not fit with the the group as a well? whole? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> it, it's really, I, I don't think it's materially damaging. So it's just cosmetic, I guess. Do you have a particular comment on, on one of the adjectives here or one of the descriptors? Just the, the, the one of these things is not like the others. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like, two the of word vulgar <laughs> seems to be out of place. <laughs> okay. It, it, never mind. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm not trying to, you know, censor you, Scott. Okay. You have Jonathan. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, Jonas. Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah, I, I was just going to suggest offensive as a replacement for vulgar. Might soften it a little bit, but. Mm. I could go with that. You know, I, what I do is run it by um, Bernie just to make sure we're not losing anything by going with offensive as opposed to vulgar, whether there's a different uh, connotation there. Diane? Any others? So, you oh, know, I have, okay. I have that similar kind of like, because we don't use vulgar very often, so I think it catches, you know, it's kind of catchy. But um, I think that when, then I looked it up to see exactly what it was, because I was thinking the same thing, Jonathan, offensive, but then that's kind of, so the two meanings of vulgar seem to fit. So it's in poor taste, or, you know, there might be something sexually explicit. So I think vulgar catches it in terms of um, uh, a stronger meaning against that um, and so what it would capture and then also what it would capture. I think having it next to religious is what might be so striking for some, but I think it's, again, you're categorizing areas of um, that might be put onto a flag that would capture things. So, Well, and ultimately it's our discretion, right? To determine what is yeah. offensive and or vulgar. Do you have Jonas? I, I, you know, I have lost, um, I had to put in my power cord, which has impacted my ability to, to hear somehow. While Chris is fixing his thing there, um, I think that 
the the main point of the conversation during the last meeting was about um, making was about making sure that the uh, that the policy was clear that display of flags. Sorry, is but I can read the transcript. I can speech. read the uh, the transcription that's up there. This change to the policy does it, and I will support it. And without um, without closely copy editing uh, the committee's work. Okay. Can you hear us? I kind of. You're frozen. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. So what's the what's the um, sense on um, vulgar? More specific definition than offensive because offensive might be two things. It may, might be too too broadest a term. People happy with hey, keeping Chris, vulgar? You might just take your video. All right, you might just take your video off and might help with. With the okay, can yeah, and then if I think the, the board agrees that vulgar should stay, and Diane read the definition of vulgar and it covers it. Where okay, great, can you hear that? Yeah, great, Thank now you. we can hear you. So, yeah, it's still, it's still hard for me to hear. I'm sorry. Um, so we'll 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 keep it as it is, and then next um, board meeting will be for approval. Correct. Okay. Uh, floor, okay. But before we move it, I, I, did Stephen have a comment? Oh, Stephen. No, no, I'm good. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So moving right along to board operations, uh, you're all set, right, Chris? That's all we had, so... <laughs> Uh, steering committee. So 5.1, we want to, uh, Jill was not able to join us uh, today and we wanted to confirm our steering committee, which is our agenda planning uh, committee. Uh, when we set this committee, we had said that we would have the, the chair, the vice chair and the clerk and make sure that we had a representation from our five different communities in it. Uh, currently, uh, Jill and Caroline are both uh, from Middlesex. So we are, uh, Jill is gonna step down and Caroline will uh, come up from Middlesex to keep the committee the same, the same size, if that is okay with everybody, if that's the pleasure of the board to keep that same system. And I've spoken to Jill, she was not able to join us today, she's in transit, but uh, she'll be at our next meeting. Okay, sounds good. Okay. So, Floor, can you just repeat the, the folks again? I just want to make sure I got it correct. So we, we have a, in the committee, we have Diane from Berlin. We have Scott from Callis. We have Jonas as our clerk and from Worcester. We have Caroline May and myself. Yeah, got you. Great. Thank you. And I just wanted, I had requested that it be opened back up because the night that I became that Berlin rep, well, I was the only one present from Berlin on that at, at that meeting. And so I just wanted to verify with Jonathan that and Vera's not here, but if you know, if either one had an interest in being the Berlin person on that, I'm more than happy to to step aside as well. So I just wanted to be sure that was known. Thank you, Diane. Hey, Jonathan, do you have a comment or I'm, I mean, if Diane's willing to do that, that's fine with me. Great. Thank you, Diane, for serving. Uh, so the next item, is, Scott, I'll pass it on to you to add to our finance uh, committee. Thank you, Flora. Basically, what I was hoping the board would agree to do and have um, uh, someone willing to sacrifice their time and energy to step up to do is essentially to replicate the same pattern that we're doing with the agenda setting group in the finance committee. At the moment, 
the finance committee is chaired by Fleur with Kari and myself from Callis and Chris from Middlesex. There's no representation from um, Berlin or from Worcester. Um, so I, I think because <clears throat> so many really important issues get filtered through the finance committee, and we just saw um, moments ago that the board is now authorizing the finance committee to approve bids and um, some of them of, of substantial amounts. Um, and the finance committee is, is the first stop for a lot of the work that will go on in different schools. And quite possibly, if we face difficult budget times, it's the, the first stop for some really hard uh, conversations about possible cuts. Um, Fleur and, and Kari, I think, made the excellent point that um, when we talked about this briefly in the finance committee meeting, was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. Um, yeah, it feels like weeks ago, um, <clears throat> that we all represent everybody in our, in our district. And that I, I agree with 100%. Um, that, but that I think is the view from inside the board. I, I think we also have to take account of how people perceive things outside the board. And if there should ever be um, hard questions facing the finance committee when <clears throat> affecting a town that does not have a, a go-to person on that uh, on the finance committee, I think it, <clears throat> it could just create difficulties, sort of political difficulties for us. So that's my pitch. Um, I'm hoping that um, Berlin and um, Worcester both would uh, the delegations from from those towns would be willing to um, step forward and, and join the committee formally. Um, I would, I'm, I'm part of the committee now, although Lisa may have been reading my mind when she did the minutes for um, her last meeting, because I'm not actually listed on the roster of the finance committee in the minutes, but I would continue to attend meetings, but not as, <clears throat> not as sort of the designated member of the finance committee. But just as you know, um, in the way that uh, Kari has, uh, and Fleur, and and to my knowledge, other uh, Chris and other committee chairs have welcomed interloper board members in, um, basically on an equal basis with their um, with the standing members of that committee. So anyway, that's my pitch. It, Diane, I see you have. A question yeah so the 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 tricky part is there's a lot of work um that you know we're all on multiple committees and um you know so i do wonder if it's possible to just get and, and maybe this is happening and this shows how i'm not able to even read everything that comes across but um if it's possible to get the agenda ahead of time so that similar to how ed quality people were very interested and were able to come at a certain point here or there if if even if we're not a voting member of that committee we could at least as a person from that town have a voice or ask questions or something i i just i mean i don't want to speak for jonathan or vera they might be able to join it but i just know i can't certainly take on another committee and it wouldn't be effective for that work either but i do respect and hear what you're saying scott because you're right there are some pretty big decisions being made and um it's important it's fine if it comes here to the board but if it's happening at the committee level then there are, are potentially some voices not being heard It, you know, I, we can we can definitely make that possible. Diane, have the finance uh, packet go out to to everybody before our finance meeting, and 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 welcome anybody that can join on a on a Tuesday at eight thirty in the morning, uh, for an hour and a half, uh, to 
to to our meetings. So that's definitely a possibility. It, Kari and, and I agree that, you know, the most important part is that we have people that are willing to to serve a, for my from my point of view. I agree we need, a, you know, a more more representation. But I feel like we I feel a strong belief, at least for myself, that I don't represent just East Montpelier. Right. Our responsibility is all our kids. And that's what we're doing all across. And I, I feel fine, completely fine having Jonas, Diane and and Stephen be the ones doing negotiations. Right. I, I have complete trust and I think we have to uh, deploy our forces uh, accordingly. So if we have any volunteers, that that would be that would be great. I had spoken to Vera before. She's not at a meeting today, but I don't I don't know that she has the bandwidth. But I, I can ask again. Stephen Luke, do you have a question? Well, I I, th I think a way forward in this discussion um, would just be that uh, our our desire is in our committees, all our committees, our preference is that we have five members and that there is one member from each town. If in reality that can't be achieved, then, you know, we, we go with what we've got. So in this case, we have two people from Calus. Um, and when those, so in the finance committee, when this um, lack of representation continues, we just continually make sure that we offer that like Scott did tonight, you know, I'm willing to step down if someone wants to step forward. Uh, and, and that's just how we approach it. I mean, we've got reality and, and reality might be that there isn't anyone else that wants to be on it. That, that sounds great. Thank you, Stephen. Does everybody feel comfortable with that? And we'll, we'll make an effort to reach out and make sure that you know, everybody is, especially if there's big decisions. And just remember, all the big decisions come to the board. The bits that we're going to approve are uh, the scope was shared with the board and our specific uh, projects. So, so it, it wouldn't be any new project that we would be coming up and in accepting a bit for. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions regarding regarding that? Otherwise, we move to five point two to try to sort of keep us ending at before nine. So board retreat, favorite subject. Uh, so we, I, we, would like, we would like to have a retreat on April. I know that we had said one meeting a month, but we, would, we are already moving our April meeting, as you recall, to the last week of April to allow our administrators to take vacation in the week that they have vacation. So, um, I'm, I'm hoping that we could all agree to meet on April 7th, the first um, Wednesday of the month, to do a retreat with the four points that we talked about at our last meeting. It, we would have a, somebody from the VSBA, and they have confirmed do the first part of the meeting for 45 minutes, and then we would move with a, with a facilitator for the next uh, two hours. Hopefully, we can meet two hours for a minutes with a maximum of three hours. And that would help us set our, our goals for next year, do our calendar and talk about the strategic planning uh, in a, you know, in an environment that we can really discuss uh, back and forth. If that is okay with you guys, I would uh, want to have a, maybe a couple other people join so that it's not just one, Brian and myself and Nick doing the, if there's somebody else that wants to join the, uh, subcommittee to to plan the retreat. I'm I'm happy to have other other voices, but those were basically the four points that we agreed at our last meeting. Scott, uh, I'll volunteer to join for if you need some help. That'll be great. Thank you. Okay, so that's all we have to report. Uh, could I have like just a thumbs up if, if uh, April 7th, uh, I, I haven't asked to, you know, clear your first Wednesdays yet from the calendar. So great. I don't see you, Caroline, but I'm assuming it's a thumb up. I'm doing a thumbs up. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Dorothy, you are too. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, moving right along, I'll pass this to Stephen and his committee, a 5.3 public comments. Um, so Chris and Scott and I got together at the direction of the board from the last meeting 
to discuss public comments and come up with some um, uh, suggestions, uh, possibilities. I, I'm not, I don't think we're presenting this for action tonight. It's more for consideration. I, I don't think this is under a specific time constraint. Um, I, I would say the first thing that needs to be discussed considered in any of the options that we're gonna present is the concept of comments versus dialogue. So the concept of uh, is the board passively listening or is the board involved in, in, in uh, active discourse um, with the community members? Um, no, no preference one way or the other, but we have to be mindful of how we want that um, dialogue to occur. So, uh, you know, um, comments versus dialogue could go either way in any of these possibilities. Um, we had one recommendation outside of board meetings. Um, again, the, the general thought was because of the change to one board meeting that, um, a chance for a, more like a public comments forum on the first Wednesday um, of the month. And it wouldn't have to be monthly. It might be bi-monthly. It might be every three months. But the concept of a, a forum that would last for an hour or an hour and a half um, in thinking that first Wednesday might be a place to do it. Um, so... That was one consideration. And it wouldn't have to be on a Wednesday. It wouldn't have to be an hour, hour and a half, but a, a forum, a chunk of time, at least an hour dedicated just to um, uh, either hearing or exchanging with the community and the board. And then there were three considerations that I would say are within a board meeting. Uh, the first consideration was um, extending the board meeting by either 15 minutes or 30 minutes and have public comments at the very beginning. So board meetings wouldn't start at, at, at six, they might start at 545. And that first 15 minutes is um, allocated strictly for public comments. If there's only five minutes worth of public comments then we start a board meeting a little early. So that was, one consideration. Uh, second consideration is we could go back to the old model where we invited comments after every action item. So everything that we voted on, um, we allowed uh, public comments after that decision. Um, and then the, th the third option was that we could keep the current plan where we have public comments at the end of the meeting. And uh, as, as much as we tried to stretch ourselves, that seemed to be the limit of our creative thinking. I invite Scott or Chris, if there's anything else to add. Scott? Thank you, Stephen. Just, uh, I, I think uh, a small correction, and I, I would defer to Chris, because he was the one who um, sort of developed this idea the one about public comments within the meeting. I think it was not after the decision, not after the vote that is, but before the vote was taken. Um, Chris, is am I, am I remembering that correctly? Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, I would describe it. Correct because um, the concern is that if you're looking for public comments about what we're discussing at the time, and then you take them after the vote, it doesn't have a real impact for the person who's making comments. So. I would say it would be before the vote, just so that we're uh, truly engaged in our Okay, so the second our option in that form, if we decided to go that way. So the 
the second option would be um, to go back to the, the the previous way of doing it and allow comments prior to a, a, a decision being prior to a vote being taken on an action item by the board. And certainly, the full board would be could tweak any of those in any particular direction they wanted to. to. Um, you know, if they wanted to go pre-meeting, it could be 10 minutes, it could be 30 minutes. Um, if they wanted to have a forum, it could be two hours or it could be 30. You know, it, we weren't wedded to particular amounts of times or things like that. It, it seemed to be um, what the board would be worth considering. It might be a worthwhile topic to add, you know, 15 minutes of discussion at a board retreat or something like that. I agree. Any yeah. questions? Kari had his hand up and Caroline did too. Kari, uh, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I mean, Stephen mentioned the forum model. I just wondered if you'd thought about that. And I, I think I think for myself, I kind of favor the, at least exploring that um, a separate hour in which we could maybe get creative about um, a topic that we want to hear from and maybe engage in the dialogue model a little bit more. Kari, I think I think our discussion around that topic was e exactly a, a, along your thinking that um, what what could be done in a forum is it could be themed around a particular item, but we wouldn't limit discussion. So if it was themed around I, I don't know the budget, then you know the first certain amount of the forum would be specific to that question, and then the rest would just be open. It wouldn't necessarily just be a, a wide open forum. It would be themed or could be themed. Great. Caroline? So I had um, watched some other board meetings and some of the things that they did was um, they had a specific time for public comment at the beginning, like 15 minutes. But then if there were topics and people had requested ahead of time, they could make public comment after the board discussion on a particular topic. Um, but they would have to write in and give the, the time. So I, I don't know, that felt a little like a hybrid of a couple of your ideas. Um, but what I really like about the public forum and using you know, maybe that first Wednesday of the month for it is it has always been a little uncomfortable to me when we hear uh, from the public, especially when it's something a little more emotional or heartfelt or passionate and um, and we sit and we don't respond where as a community forum, it would be that um, some type of dialogue. So I guess my preference is the community forum, but if we are looking for ways to have public comment at meetings. I really like I really like giving the option that if people have requested ahead of time um, that they can make a quick statement. Um, yeah, so thank you. Any other questions before I? So I was um, doing I don't a, think these a, different. A, a, um, options are mutually exclusive. Okay. So, what what I, what I was going to say is that we we could take fifteen minutes of uh, of our retreat to really think about what what that would look. It, the other option would be I, I really favor the being able to to speak before the meet. So using the first Wednesday, and because that would be a real community engagement, and that's sort of what everybody talks about it really being able to be more purposeful about what we're trying to get from the community and and set the stage for them to be felt truthfully heard if we're looking to i think if we're looking to take action uh, tonight on on community uh, comments uh, how would we how would we structure that i i think the one thing that we have to consider even if people ask for the time is that uh, you know what we've been talking about, and I'm getting my little gel on the shoulder here, saying that is you know is 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 the meeting of of board and community input is super important. So either we do it at the beginning or we do it at 
at the end, but not in between the meeting because it would make it too unruly. And we are really getting, I feel like in a rhythm this past few years, uh, this past year. So I, I wouldn't want to break that. So if with that spark any other questions or thumbs up to that or thumbs down to that. So we do both. We do community engagement on Wednesdays, most personally, especially as we're moving towards strategic planning, we're going to have to engage the community more. So it might help us get onto that rhythm. And then we, it, I, I know that there's two, I'm looking at you guys, because I know Lindy had talked before too about moving them to, to the front. And some people are okay moving it to leave it in the back. Jonas, I know you want them on the front. So how do we approach that conversation? I'm, I'm curious to hear from Chrissy too. I, I want to make sure that everybody has a voice in 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 this in in, in this important part of how to run our 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 meetings. And I don't want to put you in the spot either, Chrissy. But is that committee going back and and finalizing suggestions, or is this like they met and they brought it to us for tonight? So, so if if what I what I would offer to do is have either myself or our committee will will write up provide a written um, description of the options well before the retreat or well before a meeting, so everyone can see them and think about them. Then come to the meeting with probably preferences, we could have a discussion around those preferences and then make a decision. I think it would be unfair to try to make a decision tonight. It was just, uh, that's where our current thinking was. Um, I've heard, I think it was Caroline that, that talked about the hybrid. So we could add that as a consideration. Uh, it wasn't about limiting choices. It was trying to get a bunch down. Um, we'll put this in writing well before a decision and, uh, move forward that way I, that's what i would recommend i don't know if there's others yeah I, i'm i'm seeing a lot of heads nodding so if you could put it together uh, before our april 7th uh, retreat that'd be great and we discuss it freely uh, thumbs up i see great thank you to the committee <laughs> for putting it together um, so then we have staff appreciation. We we have these two items really is about potentially setting a, a subcommittee. So the first one would be for staff appreciation. Uh, last year, Diane and myself took that on, and I'm wondering if there's any volunteers uh, for. I nominate Chrissy because she's amazing at this type of thing. Chrissy, <laughs> okay. All right, so we have Chrissy in. Did she give a thumbs up? I just nominated he her. Did. I don't he, know if she was nominated. Yeah. Okay, good. I did. <laughs> she did. That's great. Thank you, Chrissy in. Anybody else joining Chrissy? Diane. I can yeah. do that. Yeah, and I can do that. Yeah. Do you get that, Lisa? You have, yeah. Was, uh, Di was Diane on that too, or was it Christina and Lindy? But Christina, Diane, and Lindy. Okay. More the better. Uh, and then uh, we have the 50th anniversary at U32, and we were wondering if there's bandwidth for uh, a couple of people to take that on um, and, and really establish a wider committee. I sent an email this morning. I don't know if you saw the reply to Rosemary uh, to try to figure out we, you know, our administrators at U32 are already doing uh, some of the work, but this is the last that we don't in, the, in a very thin margin of time. So if there would be a, a couple of, of people and it could be community members, it could be just one member of, of, our, of our board being, part of that committee uh, if there's no bandwidth from our we're at all in different committee we explore just having a uh, alumni and uh, and uh, it, other you know having Corrine possibly in and, and rosemary uh, 
be the committee and coordinate that. I'm, I'm just putting it out there. I'm, we, I didn't have a full plan, but what I share in my email is, is my concern is to not put this on Brian, Stephen, Amy, or anybody at U32. They're already doing some. Yes, Scott. Uh, thanks, Philip. I'm just wondering um, if we might be, um, I don't know, drifting a little bit from our mission in getting involved in, in sort of um, social uh, organizing. Um, it, it seems, as you were saying about alumni and community, and um, I mean, I don't know if, I, I haven't heard of U32 having a parent-teacher organization, but it, it seems as though this is the sort of thing that would be most appropriate um, for them. We can definitely do something board-like, um, you know, come up with a statement, come up with, you know, some sort of um, gesture that is appropriate to the board. But in terms of kind of organizing a, um, an event, um, that's, that's not really, doesn't seem to me that's, that that's really within our our scope of um, work, I guess. Any any other thoughts? Uh, that that sounds okay with me. I I could at least volunteer to try to coordinate the alumni to get get the committee that is not us together and connect them with the with the U thirty two. I see Lindy has, has her hand up too. And and maybe some of our students in our community. Oh, I see Anna too has her hand up too. Maybe that's something that would be uh, uh, Lindy and then Anna, you're on deck. Um, it seems like when, with graduated classes, there is a group of alumna who put on their reunions, who get them together. And that seems like the avenue for some of this. Um, as board members, sometimes we give diplomas to kids from our town or whatever, and that might be a way to include some of the alumna is in, if we're able to be in person for graduation or something. But I do think it should be a committee from something like that. Your email was very informative that the high school seems to have pretty well in hand activities and plans so that the graduates are recognized um, as the 50th. So I think reaching out to the association that forms these reunions from U32 and asking how they'd like to be a part of it um, would be better than the board. I agree with Scott on that part because there's going to be elementary schools who have re you know years or whatever. And um, it seems more appropriate for the graduating class to have some part in it. Sounds great. Anna? Um, so I know a bunch of you do know that our school's newspaper is doing a big thing to, you know, commemorate and celebrate yeah. um, 50 years either too. And I don't know if some like cheesy video will like something if you just have a um like PSA I think that it could go on to our social newspaper um because a lot of people um do see that and do look at that so it could be a more public wide thing and you could put it there thank you Anna it, it was a little hard to hear you but I think I got most of what you were saying uh, Stephen um I, I mean I agree um with Scott and Lindy, I think um, this type of work would be best served outside of the board structure because it would allow it to be nimble and it would allow it to be flexible and not bound by, um, you know, uh, um, board meeting requirements and warnings and meet notes taken and posted within five days. Um, I, I just think it would we don't want to burden this group with all those responsibilities. Let them be flexible and nimble. And if there's board members that want to get involved, you know, let the board members know what groups are doing things and they can volunteer and serve. That's great. I think that's plenty of guidance. Thank you, everybody. Um, 
If there's any other question, not other questions, let's move to the consent agenda. Could I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve there's the minutes of, of I'll move to approve the minutes of March 1st and March 3rd. Second it. Thank you, John. Thank you, Diane. All those in favor of approving the minutes as submitted. Oh, oh wait. Scott's waving his hand. Scott. Scott. Thanks for that. Sorry. Um, oh, just good. one one correction. Mm -hmm. um, on the uh, let me see. Um, which page was it? Ninety five. Yeah, these board packets are way too short. N 90, <laughs> 95. Um, uh, on finance committee, my name should follow Chris McVeigh's, please. Gotcha. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no need for apologies. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Lisette. So, all those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, please say yes or aye. 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 Yeah, do you let me move the board orders, please? The board order? Is that what you were saying? Yes, um, please. Sorry, I'm getting a little yeah. sweaty here. Um, I make a motion to approve the board order in the total amount of $174,386.71. cents. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions or discussion about the board orders? Seeing all heads nodding no. Uh, all those in favor of approving the minute, uh, approving, sorry, approving the board orders uh, as read by Lindy, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any, any opposed to the board orders? Orders, any no votes? No, I see none. The ayes appear to have it, so the board orders are approved. Um, moving into personnel, I'm sorry that my internet is unstable. Um, on page, oh. could, we, could I have a I'm going to try the camera again because this is super weird to not. Can you hear me? I just asked a couple of people to get off their devices. Uh, could I have a motion for the new teacher nominations for 21-22 school year? I can do that, Floor. Um, I make a motion to accept the new teacher nominations for Erica Smith as a U32 speech and language pathologist and Gwen Gothier as the WCUUSD speech language pathologist. Could I have a second, please? I'll second. Okay, Jonah seconds. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor of approving the new teachers for the year 21-22, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Please say no. I don't hear anything. The motion carries. Um, could I have a motion? Do we need a motion, Brian, to accept the retirement? Uh, yes, uh, and I do know that uh, I would also like to call on Jen Miller. Uh, she has a, uh, she would like to say a few words. Go ahead, Jen. So um, Ann Carter is gonna have her second retirement. Ann has contributed so much to this district over decades, um, primarily as a special educator at East Montpelier Elementary School. When she retired from that 
position, um, she joined us as a part-time instructional coach. I've had the pleasure and the privilege to work with Anne in that capacity for a few years. She is going to retire fully from Washington Central. She's written a letter to the board and leadership team, and I would love to read it to you all. So this is Anne with her coaching hat on too. Dear WCUUSD board members, administration and leadership team, after 40 years of being a Vermont educator, 30 in the Washington Central District, I've decided it is time for me to fully retire at the end of the 2020-2021 academic year. This career has been incredibly rewarding and I appreciate all of the various experiences I have had throughout these years. However, it is time for me to become unscheduled so my husband and I can visit our adult children and our granddaughter in addition to heading off to parts of the world unknown to us. It's time for us to foster our lifelong curiosity and explore other places and activities. As all of you continue to serve the staff, students, and community within this district, I urge you to listen more, reserve judgment, and stay curious longer. Sincerely, Ann Carter. She's going to be missed, you know, just really missed. Thank you for your I'm going to have be and the mode to accept a environment with I will move to accept the retirement of Ann Carter and Emily Heckler. It's a, uh, Emily's not retiring, it's a resignation, but sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. sorry, they're just the retirement then. Yeah. Sorry, and I amend it with appreciation. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> For the 30 years of service. Yeah. Lindy, you're seconding? I, sure, I second. <laughs> sorry, to interrupt. Sorry. No, that's fine. All those in favor of approving Anne's retirement, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it and have a wonderful retirement. It, moving on to resignations, could we have a motion, please? Sure. I'll make a motion to accept the resignation of Emily Heckler, the WCU USD speech language pathologist. Second. And then, thank you, Caroline. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the resignation of Emily Heckler, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Hearing none, the motion carries. Um, we don't have any leaves. Subs that's all I have, Brian. Am I missing any? No, you're not. You, that's it. OK. Yeah, and now, finally, public comments. <laughs> Do we have any? I don't see anybody. Okay, moving right on until on to future agenda items. At our uh, agenda planning meeting, we we discuss uh, you know sort of either color coding this or or trying to I, I, you know I'll look to Diane who had this idea to so that we can be more specific. So maybe when we're working uh, in our retreat in the you know part of setting our calendar, we can figure out a, a better way to, to make sure we stay on top of the future agenda items was uh, her recommendation. So we're, we're working on it. Just know that. Are there any extra ones that we want to add to our growing future agenda items? No. Okay. And Flora, if I could just, so the color coding was like, if you look at that list, there's a number yeah. of things that will become part of the conversations at like the retreat or there might be some that are part that go together 
So that was what the thought of color coding so that at a glance you could see, oh, at the retreat, we're actually going to tackle at least the initial work of some of it. Yes, completely. And, and we're going to try to tackle the retreat at least three of this item. So, it, so that will remove some items and make room for new ones. It, board reflection. Scott, are you speaking to us or no? No, okay, oh, good. <laughs> it, board reflection. Go ahead, Lindy. Um, I think we had rich discussion tonight as well as finished very close to nine o'clock. Um, so I appreciate as much information as we got on the scholar, the residents, um, and then still getting through this. Laura, now you're muted. Oh, I felt the discussion with Shelly. Sorry that I let it go a little bit long, but it was so important and meaningful. And I think we all enjoyed it. Yeah, so I rushed you through the rest, but thank you for keeping up. Uh, and I, I, while I do think it is good to be timely and I, and I, you know, I, I appreciate keeping as close as we can. It was a rich discussion. And so I think it would have cheapened it to shorten it. Um, and that it's good to some to for that reason. So um, I appreciated your allowing that to happen. Great, thank you. So with that said, do you want to have a motion to say goodbye to Stephen? <laughs> He's still in. The I don't know. Here. But... 2105 will adjourn now. Could I have a motion and congratulations, Stephen, again? I'm super excited. I make, I make a motion we adjourn. Thank you, Lindy. A second? I'll second it. Thank you, Caroline. Are you all set, Lisa? Thank you for keeping up with us. Okay. Good night, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.